All right, we are now recording. Welcome. Oh yeah, so we've got 20 people so far. If more join, that's great. Um, yeah, welcome. This is the collage, the Hale Collage course, uh, also at CU, known as the Astro 6000 Seminar. Um, yeah, people were talking right before I record about this image. Yeah, this is one of those AI generated image. I, I gave it the, uh, the title of the course, Coronal Heating, Solar Wind and Space Weather. And, uh, and that's what it gave me. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, th there wow. are different options to these things. And also, if you, if you do this enough times, there's a, there is sort of a certain sameness to these images that, that, that come out, uh, at least this generation of them, maybe the next few next few generations of AI will, you know, sample from a bigger pool of, of source images or something, but eh, it's pretty cool. So I, I, um, I, I use the word uh, solar wind, trying to see if I can get it up as my background image in time for it to be fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah, here it is. So, oh, it, it's zoomed in. It looks really cool in the zoomed out version. Yeah. But, well, maybe that should be the first uh, unofficial assignment. <laughs> uh, modify the, the, the prompts, modify the prompts to, uh, to, to get something interesting. Anyway, yes. Um, so uh, yes, so I've got the, uh, I've got the, uh, the chat open 7 p.m. in St. Thomas. Wow. All right. All right. So yes, so let me start. Um, yeah, so I guess today I just have some introductory things to say. Um, I'm ready to move on to the next set of, you know, next week's lecture notes if there's a huge gap of time at the end, but I don't think there will be. Um, so I guess I can just sort of go through some of the administrative parts of the course. Um, uh, this is topics in coronal heating, solar, stellar, wind acceleration, and space weather. Um, I'm Steve Cranmer. Tom Berger is also on the call, who's going to be... Uh, teaching some of the uh, modules later on in the semester on space weather. Um, the course is just one hour a week uh, during this time slot. Um, unfortunately, we were trying to do a three credit course option and that was a little uh, unwieldy for, for several reasons. Oh, I realized I have the old version of the syllabus up here where I was hopefully thinking that we'd be in person at CU, uh, but no, we're in, we're in the Zoomiverse for the, for the foreseeable future. Um, and yeah, for the people in Boulder, we're gonna keep meeting primarily on Zoom rather than trying to do a dual thing in the classroom. Um, I've got a webpage for the course with some materials up there, including these uh, slides for today. Um, there's a poll out for the office hours. I sent that out in one of the emails. If you haven't gotten the link to the poll, uh, I'll keep it open for a few more days. Let me know and I'll send you the, uh, the whenisgood.com poll. Um, yeah, I'll say a little bit more about the history of collage because it's been an interesting program. Uh, yeah, and we're, we're gonna be basically looking at the corona, the solar wind and its impact on you know, human life and technology as we go along. Collage has been a, a, a interesting thing for now almost a full decade. Um, the NSO uh, uh, accepted Boulder's bid as the new as the new home for the National Solar Observatory in 2011 or 2012 or so, um, and this program started soon after. So the collaborative graduate graduate education program Collage. I think the original acronym was CGIP, but collage is nicer. Um, this was really just uh, designed to help us offer more advanced, you know, research grade level courses in solar physics to 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 grad students in our in our solar community. Uh, but the problem is doing that at each university independently often runs into this small number problem. You know, it's hard to get instructors and it's hard to get students in a sufficient number to have the course be officially offered. So we're trying to, you know, pull everybody together and have a, have a, a joint course that, that really strengthens our, our, our community. The, uh, the table at the bottom shows uh, how, we've, how we've ended up uh, distributing the topics of solar physics through the different uh, courses. We've tried to cycle through all the different topics and we're trying to now get to a few that we've, we've uh, seldom, or even in the case of the solar wind, that we've never actually uh, focused a lot of time on. Um, 
Yeah, and for, for as long as I've been involved, we've been talking about trying to synchronize it to a cycle of modules that will repeat every three or four years, but uh, that hasn't happened. You know, we, we, we teach the topics as the instructors become available. Hopefully that gives uh, a good enough uh, breadth of, of, of topics over the years. And we've, we've tried to record as much as we could from all these past courses and make those available too. Uh, this year, we will be doing the topics I've been talking about. Uh, here's a draft schedule, you know, a few weeks on coronal heating, you know, this, this big problem of how, how is the corona heated to a million degrees, um, and then moving outwards into the magnetic field lines that stretch through, stretch out through the heliosphere and the solar wind. I've got a few specific days on here to go through uh, hands-on exercises, essentially Python, Jupyter notebooks. Um, that are still in the process of being created. We'll get there. Um, and then talking about the solar wind and a little bit on CMEs and how they, you know, how they're accelerated. Um, and then a good chunk of time in March and April on space weather. And then we'll finish with some other, other topics. Um, for those of you who are taking this course for credit, and I'm not quite sure what the percentage is for the people on the call, um, uh, I'll be handling the grading for the CU part of it. For those of you taking this course for, for credit, official credit at, at a different university, hopefully you've arranged for a, an instructor of record or so at that university. If you haven't, please let me know and I can do my part to try to help out getting that uh, on the books for you. But if you're just taking it as a as an informal auditor, that's that's fine too. Please feel free to engage as much as you like with these with these activities. Um, again, it's just a one credit seminar, so no exams, no big long problem sets. Um, it's it's essentially fifty percent uh, participation in the discussions on the papers that we'll read, and there'll be something like five or six of them um, uh, throughout the throughout the semester, um, and the other half on these. Uh, uh, hands-on uh, computation type assignments. For the papers, um, at the end of this set of slides, I'll, I'll say a bit about the paper for next week, but, uh, but we'll start that process soon. And hopefully all of you have received invitations to the Slack channel where, we'll, where we will do those discussions um, primarily. Um, and I've got initial prompts up, up on, the, on the first Slack uh, workspace channel called Paper One Discussion. So, uh, so the yeah, sort of example questions that you can address, um, but you can also sort of talk about any aspects of these papers that you like. Um, yeah, because I still don't know the exact number of papers, the exact sort of required number of the responses to these prompts is not quite set, but I think it's gonna be this, this three N that I talk about here. You know, if we do six papers, it'll be, you know, 18 prompts or something. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll, this, this will spill over a bit into the, into the class time after each one, but also I, I hope we can, we can uh, do a lot of the discussion on the Slack too. Uh, this other half for the computation exercises, it's still a work in progress. Um, I haven't I haven't based a grade on these things yet myself. I, I've I've written a few of them for for a different class, um, but uh, but but this is sort of an experiment as we go. I also watched how uh, Ivan Milich did this in the past few years worth of uh, collage recordings. Um, but yeah, so basically I'll I'll. I'll be I'll be providing sort of a, a, a an initial version with sort of a skeleton of of things done in these and we can we can step through them in, in the class and then the, the actual assignment for you will be to make your own copy and do something interesting with it you know extend it in some way possibly add more physics or new ways of visualizing what what it computes um, or again if if Python isn't your thing. Uh, and try it in some other in some other uh, programming system. Um, yeah, and we'll talk more about these as we go. And I guess I wanted to just also sum up the different the different uh, venues here. We're here on Zoom, and I, I am trying to monitor the chat. The, the chat. Um, we've got our Slack channel. 
Uh, there's this web page that's mainly just going to be an outward facing web page where I post things that you can that you can download. There's a schedule there and I'll have the slides. Office hours, I will try to uh, get get settled soon and I'll email everybody when those will be. Um, eventually, we'll put the uh, videos of the classes up on the uh, NSO's collage web page. Um, I'm not sure how long that'll take and maybe if if there are delays, I'll try to just put them on my own YouTube uh, channel if I if I can. Um, for the CU students, we'll be using Canvas for a few things, really just sort of grading related details, submitting assignments and all. Um, and I think, was that it for this initial thing? Yes. Let me just go back to this for a second. Um, yeah, any questions about the actual operation of the of the course? Okay. All right. So I guess the rest of today was really just going to be a sort of a sort of a visual summary of, you know, solar physics, the corona and the heliosphere. You know, I've got a, some some pretty pictures to show of, you know, the sun and the corona. Um, I'm sure you've all seen a lot of these things, but I want to make sure this is accessible to students without much of a solar background also. Um, you know, you've got the sun in visible light here. We're looking at the solar photosphere. The features you can see, of course, are the sunspots. One interesting thing is if you look near the east and west limbs of the sun as the sunspots come around, you can see these bright, brighter regions surrounding the sunspots. Those are the so-called faculae. And it's kind of interesting that when you measure the total irradiance of the sun over all wavelengths, the... Uh, the, uh, the maximum of the sunspot cycle, when there are the most dark sunspots on the surface, actually the sun overall is brighter than it is at the minimum of the cycle when there are less, when there are fewer sunspots. So it's really these bright faculae around the sunspots that, that you present extra brightness whenever there's a sunspot around. So they're actually very important for, uh, for the overall radiation budget of the sun. Of course, we're interested in looking at the corona, and of course, there we often look in other wavelengths. This is the extreme ultraviolet 171 angstrom uh, band, and the sunspots are now replaced by the bright active regions. You can see loops of magnetic field that are evolving in all sorts of ways. Um, I hope that the cadence of the, the movie that I'm seeing is somewhat close to what you're seeing uh, over Zoom. Um, there's a point, yeah, there was a point where the SDO spacecraft underwent a, uh, a rotation, but yeah, there's all sorts of interesting things you can see there. Um, so yeah, I guess I just wanted to go through some of these different layers and introduce them a little bit. Uh, the, the photosphere, of course, is this uh, visible surface of the sun. If you're studying the, uh, the radiation field, it's the, it's the point at which the radiation transitions from optically thick to optically thin. You know, in an optically thick region, photons are bouncing around and continuously being you know, absorbed and re-emitted. Above that point, the photons essentially escape, uh, escape into space. And the transition is a very, very narrow transition governed by the, uh, the, uh, the uh, density scale height at the surface of the sun, which is small compared to the radius. So it looks very sharp. When you look in detail, of course, at the sun, you see these, you see the so-called solar granulation patterns. And you know, if you haven't seen this before, and if you think it looks a lot like you know the top of a pot of boiling water, then that's the good analogy because it's the same kind of thing. It's it's the it's rising convection cells and falling uh, downdrafts in those dark lanes in between. The uh, the size of the granules is uh, each of those granules is a, is about one megameter across, um, and across the entire you know, the, 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 diam the radius of the sun is about 700 megameters. So there's about 1400 of those uh, granules across. Yeah, name, um, there, there's various names for these convection patterns on the sun because of the magnetic field and other things. I don't know if some of the classical fluid dynamic names are, uh, are, are exactly applicable, but yeah. Um, so yeah, so these are tiny little, uh, tiny little patterns across the sun. There's also this larger scale pattern of super granulation, uh, 30 megameters across. So there's only about 50 of those across the diameter of the sun. We'll see pictures of those later. 
Um, yeah, and in the bottom, I just wanted to give you some of the jargon. You know, part of this first lecture is sort of a, a, a jargon introduction because you know solar physicists often speak in, in, in terms of these things. Um, the umbra and the penumbra of the sunspot. The umbra is essentially the central region where the magnetic field is so strong and so vertical that it uh, that the strong magnetic tension suppresses the convection, right? If you look up close at the level of the granulation in the umbra, you won't really see any. Uh, there's other variable things, but you won't see the granulation. And it's dark because these rising convective cells are what's carrying the energy, carrying the heat up from the interior of the sun. And we don't, and that's that's suppressed in the in the sunspots. Some of that energy eventually sort of goes off to the side to create the uh, the uh, brighter faculty in those surrounding regions. Um, but yeah, that's really why sunspots are dark because the convection is suppressed. Moving up from the photosphere, there's the chromosphere. It was originally called that because of the bright, you know, colorful ring from line emission at different wavelengths in, uh, in eclipses. Um, but of course, now we can sort of image the entire sun in the, in the light of these spectral lines, uh, say H alpha or calcium uh, K, H and K lines on the right. And in that purple image on the right, that's where you can start to see the supergranulation pattern. The, the, the cells aren't always filled in. So typically people talk about the supergranular network, which is the bright features along the edges of those cells that you can kind of see. They don't sort of form full, full you know, circular patterns around each cell. Um, but yeah, that's the, that's the supergranules. Um, and there's still a lot of controversy about what causes the supergranulation. Is it just a larger scale of convective bubbling up from deeper layers under the surface? Or is it something else entirely? I don't know if we're going to get to talk too much about it. I tend to think it's something else entirely. It's something more magnetically driven rather than convectively driven. But maybe we'll get a chance to do something on that later in the semester. And of course, going up from the chromosphere, we've got the corona, you know, first, first viewed in, in the light of uh, uh, total solar eclipses. This is one of these beautiful images from uh, Miloslav Druckmuller. Um, and if you don't know of his website of eclipse photography, I highly recommend it. I should probably find a link to it somewhere. But yeah, beautiful, beautiful eclipse images. Um, yeah, so the first part of the course, well, we're going to be dealing with this uh, heating problem. You know, why, you know, as soon as you start looking at the and analyzing the light in the chromosphere in the corona in more detail, we realize that the temperature that's producing or the, the plasma that's producing that light is at a higher temperature than what is at the, uh, the solar photosphere. So the question is, what's causing that heating as you go up from the photosphere? If you're getting further and further from these sources of energy that are sitting down at the solar surface or below, and typically you would think that the further you get away from those sources of energy, the temperature should drop. Uh, these plots of models of the solar chromosphere and corona have this blue dotted curve at the bottom there that shows what would happen if there was no heating, right? The temperature would just keep dropping as you go up. I guess I should clarify that that x-axis is kind of a strange coordinate. It's the, it's the height above the solar photosphere in units of the solar radius. And it's a logarithmic scale showing tiny little changes above the photosphere on the left to much I hope you can hear me. I just had a internet reconnect thing. Um, yeah, much larger scales above. Um, yeah, and you see the temperatures, you know, increasing, right? And these are models of both co uh, closed coronal loops, right? That's the orange, red, and black curves because they all stop at a certain point above the surface because uh, these models assume that the loops are symmetric, you know, as you go up. As you go up on one side, you reach the top, the temperature reaches a maximum. Then on the other side, everything is just sort of reflected about that point. Um, and then the green dash dotted curve is an example model of the, the coronal heating that's happening in the solar wind. You know, magnetic flux tubes that, that start at the sun and stretch all the way out into the, into the heliosphere. Coronal heating is happening in all those different places. So yeah, the first few weeks we'll be looking at why that happens. Oops. Um, yeah, we'll also be engaging a lot with the observations. And I just wanted to say a few things about uh, the, the different modalities, the different ways to observe. 
the sun. You know, we've got remote sensing from telescopes, but there are differences between ground-based and space-based uh, telescopes. And then, of course, uh, there's other types of things in you know, spacecraft being sent out into the solar wind that fly directly through the particles and fields that, that we want to learn about. And there are advantages and disadvantages to, to all these different uh, ways. I think I was trying to remain sort of positive <laughs> in these uh, bullets below, but there are, there are you know, disadvantages too, right? For ground-based telescopes, yes, we're limited to certain, certain wavelengths that make it through the Earth's atmosphere, but because we can actually access these telescopes and you know, maintain them, we can make them you know, quite big to, to improve our spatial resolution, and we can maintain them and you know, fix instruments when they break and things like that. Or we could send telescopes into space, of course, then the whole electromagnetic spectrum is opened up to us. Um, we don't have to worry about uh, things like the Earth's atmosphere causing uh, you know, turbulence and messing up our lines of sight. The, the, everything is much more stable up in space. Uh, no weather issues. But of course, there are, there are negatives too. Um, yeah, I guess as I think of it, there, there's, if, if you want it in the chat, there's, there's one character you could type in the chat that represents the, the, uh, the disadvantage of space-based telescopes. And I'm curious if, if anybody can think, think of what that character is. I'll wait maybe just a few seconds and see if anybody, that's it, Fallon, yes, dollar sign. It's the money that re that's required to send things up into space, right? Yeah, yes, ground-based telescopes cost cost money too, but as far as you know, per dollar, I think you can get a much you know bigger and much higher quality telescope on the ground than than having to actually send it up into space. So and lastly, is that little things can be sent up fairly easy as um, add-ons nowadays, uh, which which might end up being cheap again. Yeah, yeah, and you know, there's been talk of. Uh, of you know assembling things in space you know robotically I guess so maybe larger things can be put together. Uh, of course, JWST just had uh, had uh, had some success in deploying much larger things that could have fit than than what could have fit into a rocket fairing. Um, what is that telescope on the left? Is that <laughs> is that Big Bear? It's right on the it's right on a lake, and Big yeah. Bear is right on the lake. Yeah, yeah, that's Big Bear, the yeah. original. Yeah. Or big bear too uh they've they've since upgraded the telescope from the little one peeking out of the dome there um it's an, yeah, it's now a 1.6 meter so it's quite large yeah yeah so telescopes lots of trade-offs and of course there's these uh, in situ the latin phrase just means in place you know it's detecting the things you want to detect by flying right through them it goes right to where the plasma is um yeah, and it's it's been a great help in terms of understanding the properties of plasma throughout the whole, you know, uh, magnetosphere, heliosphere, basically everywhere we've been able to send spacecraft uh, to. Um, the disadvantage often is just that it's this single point measurement, right? With with telescopes, you you can look at something far away and you can get a whole image and, and get a good macroscopic feel for how it looks. If you're just flying one little point through something. It's, it's much harder to get that uh, three-dimensional perspective. Uh, much more recently, spacecraft have been flying in, in, in collections and in constellations. So they've been able to get a, lot, a little bit more spatial information about what they're flying through. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still an intrinsic uh, uh, you know, limitation to, to what they can do. Um, I guess I had some other just fun images of the, of the, of the corona. Right, this is a, a picture from the Yoko uh, uh, X-ray telescope. The images look a little bit different than the ones that we are traditionally seeing through the EUV, um, because X-rays are sampling a slightly different uh, set of plasma conditions. Now, the EUV has been a very, you know, uh, major stalwart of our uh, of our ability to observe the sun in the last decade or so. The SDO spacecraft has been a trooper in sending down these the huge amounts of data, uh, you know, these 4K images every 10 seconds of the sun, not in every single band, but but something every 10 seconds. So it's terabytes per day of, of data in all these different bands. Yeah, we can we can talk about some of the sensitivity, you know, of, of 
what the different uh, wavelengths are sensitive to in terms of the layers of the photosphere, chromosphere, uh, corona as we go forward. Um, oh yeah, another way of course of visualizing the light is to look at the spectrum of the sun. Now this plot is sort of a hybrid observation and, and model uh, uh, plot. And I also have cheated a little bit by instead of just plotting the intensity, I plot the intensity per unit wavelength divided by wavelength, just to, to tilt it a little bit so we can see the, see the uh, UV and X-ray uh, parts of the corona a little bit better. But the, the orange curve that shows what a black body uh, at the photospheric temperature would look like has also been shifted properly so that we can see that all this excess light from the, e, from the UV to the X-ray is really the, the, the dominant emission of the, of the corona. Um, the other one of the other important measurable things that are that is important not just for understanding the corona but also understanding you know space weather and the solar wind is the magnetic field at the photosphere of the sun because that's a very useful lower boundary condition for extrapolating out into the heliosphere. Um, if you've taken any of uh, Ivan Milich's uh, previous collage courses, I think there's been a lot of talk of the spectropolarimetry and the modeling that's required to understand the uh, you know basically to 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 produce these uh, magnetogram type maps of the magnetic field strength at the solar photosphere you know gray in these pictures is essentially zero field and strong white and strong black are high intensity fields of of the two different polarities um, you can of course see that, so, that sunspots often have the polarities coming in pairs because they're actually loops you know bipolar magnetic field concentrations that are poking up through the sun's surface. Um, now these individual magnet magnetograms that are produced uh, you know, for a specific you know, instant of time are useful. But what is also useful to do is to collect them over an entire solar rotation over about a month and to collect them into a so-called synoptic magnetogram, essentially tile the full uh, sphere of the sun with magnetic field. That's what produces a very useful lower boundary condition, condition for extrapolating outwards. Um, yeah, longitude versus latitude. And mentioning that now brings us to the first little bit of official jargon that I want to make sure everybody is, is on the same page with, and that's this, uh, this phenomenon of Carrington rotations. If you've, if you've taken a course on the sun, you've probably seen something about the sun's differential rotation. You've probably seen these uh, cartoon pictures of the, of the solar cycle that shows what happens as this differential rotation you know, winds up a, a magnetic field. And, and you know, basically, the, the evolution of that field dominates the 11-year uh, the solar cycle. But when we start to talk about the regions above the solar surface, there is a lot less differential rotation. On the left is, a, is, is an image uh, produced from some results of Larissa Christa a few years ago, showing that the uh, features in the low corona, essentially coronal holes, do undergo a little bit of differential rotation, but they, uh, in the same sense as the photosphere does, but it's a lot more rigid. It's a lot more rigidly rotating over, over latitude. Um, Oh, interesting question about the uh, about the uh, white versus black spots on the on the on the surface, and that, I should probably just go back and, and mention that. The 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 I, I don't think there's a huge amount of actual motion of the plasma along these field lines. There might be a little bit, but in general, the the motion is sort of symmetric between the fields. So when I'm saying pointing out versus pointing in, that's just our our convention for the fact that a positive magnetic polarity. Uh, is often defined as pointing out of a surface and negative is defined as pointing in. So yeah, there's not necessarily a lot of motion happening uh, along those along those arrows. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this uh, so this differential rotation does not exist that strongly above above the photosphere. Uh, the, the corona is a strong magnetic field region. so there's strong magnetic tension that keeps everything sort of rigidly rotating. And the average rotation period is something like 27.27 something something days. And that's called the Carrington rotation period. Um, throughout the history of solar physics, these have been counted, right? There was a Carrington rotation number one that was 
that was inaugurated, I think, by Carrington or by somebody else from Carrington's data in the 1800s. And now we're up to the 2250s of numbered rotations. Um, and, and it's the Carrington rotation number that is usually cited as the identifier for these uh, synoptic uh, maps. So I just wanted to make sure we all knew what that was. There's one other bit of jargon that I think is very interesting. It's sort of a historical piece of jargon about coordinates for how do we label features on the sun. Um, there's different types of coordinates. Uh, I think the ones I'm showing here are measured from that central plus at the, at the central meridian of the, of the sun you know, south 26, west 7, and all that. But the big question is, what is up with this compass wheel around the sun? Naha, uh -huh. it doesn't look like a normal, right? West should be on the left, shouldn't it? Um, but solar physicists have this tradition of calling that, that limb that's rotating towards us on the left, the east limb. I think it just comes from the traditional, um, position of the sun in the sky, right? If the sun is rising, you know, cue the, cue the Lion King theme. Um, if the sun is rising and we're looking at the place where it's rising, what is the side of the sun that is closest to the eastern horizon of the earth? It's the east limb of the sun. I think that's the historical reason behind east being over here. I guess if you really wanted a way of thinking about it, the uh, if, if you're also looking at pictures of the sun as things are rotating around the limb on the on the on the left hand side, yes, things are sort of rising towards you as they're coming coming over the east limb, so Where rising in the east. That's in the west. Yeah, that's one way of doing it. But I think historically it was just it's the limb that's closer to the eastern horizon as we're observing it from here on Earth. Um, I guess I had some other jargon, you know, just the different features in the in the in the corona. Um, you know, I, I've already mentioned that active regions and sunspots tend to coincide with each other. There are some uh, bright, loopy-like things, like what we see in active regions that aren't associated with with active regions. So we'll often talk about coronal loops uh, that don't have to necessarily be rooted in active regions. Uh, some active regions have magnetic fields that are kind of twisted, and, and this term sigmoid is often used just, just to mean S-shape, and these twisted magnetic fields are often very uh, unstable to producing things like solar flares, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, uh, yeah, there's plenty of other jargon, right? There's these dark regions that are seen in the UV and the X-ray called coronal holes. They tend to be dark because the magnetic fields at the, you know, rooted on the sun here are, are kind of weak and unipolar, right? There's no sort of only one polarity in a, in a coronal hole. And that one polarity tends to expand all the way out into the solar wind. So some of the plasma that is trapped on these closed field lines everywhere else on the sun has escaped into the, into the uh, solar wind. So we see less uh, emission there. Um, so we talked about the, 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 the lowest intensity things. We talked about the highest intensity things as the active regions. Everything in between is often given this sort of nondescript name of the quiet sun. Um, it's very uh, uh, non-rigorously non defined. Uh, when you're looking off the limb, there's all sorts of other features. Some of the largest loops uh, get stretched uh, into the solar wind. They're often called helmet streamers. I think the um, I think the etymology there is from these World War One German helmets with the points on the top, um, but I've never actually seen seen that you know confirmed by the by the people who uh, who must have come up with that back in the 1940s or 50s or so. Um, so there are these helmet streamers that are basically large loops with the two different magnetic polarities at either end that get stretched out, but there are also more complicated magnetic regions. The so-called pseudo streamers also exist. Uh, they are essentially regions with uh, the same polarity on both sides. So that means that inside there have to be there has to be more than one loop because essentially, if the magnetic field is going up here, it's going down in the middle, down over here, and then up on this side as well. And they often tend to be uh, coordinated with things like uh, prominence cavities. 
uh, other types of twisted magnetic field that can be cooler than the rest of the uh, rest of the corona. Uh, we might talk a little bit about the types of solar wind that are connected to these different large scale features that stretch all the way out later on. Um, yeah, and I guess this this brings us further out into the place where the solar wind uh, the solar wind accelerates. I also wanted to just point out April eighth, twenty twenty four is going to be the next uh, continental U.S. Uh, total eclipse, and it's going through essentially a, a good fraction of the middle of the country. So it's a good good thing to put on your calendar. But as you go out even further from the sun, of course, this extended corona, extended solar atmosphere just keeps going and going. And uh, you know, the, the features we see tend to become tend to become sort of radially oriented outward because the solar wind is now pulling everything out. And yeah, that's that's really going to be the next sort of major piece of the course, the solar wind. Um, it's got some really fascinating history from the late 50s and early 60s, you know, it was first predicted theoretically by Gene Parker. And there was a good four years of uncertainty there where uh, Parker's ideas were, were, you know, poked at and questioned. And that's a good thing in science, of course. But uh, he, was, he was essentially vindicated by the actual discovery of the solar wind when uh, spacecraft started to be sent outside the Earth's magnetosphere for the first time. And Martian Neugebauer and others uh, you know, confidently de detected the actual continuously outflowing solar wind. It's happening throughout the entire heliosphere, really. Um, and this image on the right is a nice sort of picture um, of the uh, of the solar wind. Yeah, Parker's initial paper was was rejected. Yeah, he had to he had to really go through channels with the Chandrasekhar, I guess, who was the editor at the time to get, to get it through. Um, yeah, some some interesting history. We, we we might actually read Parker's original paper as a as one of the papers later on in the in the course. But yeah, as far as a picture of the solar wind, I thought this this wavelet processed coronagraph image uh, or movie would be a, a nice thing because if you really look closely, and again, I'm hoping that through Zoom you can see the uh, the proper cadence of these movies. Um, that, that your eye really does is able to pick out the fact that there's that there's outward expansion pretty much everywhere in, in movies like this. All right. Um, yeah. And of course, the the a lot of the detection of the solar wind happens via these in situ um, uh, particle and field detecting spacecraft at at roughly at one AU because it's easier to keep a lot of things close to the Earth. Um, and yeah, there's there's variability in the solar wind. You know, the, there's a good factor of two or three variability in the uh, solar wind speed that's measured at the Earth. I've got one year's worth of solar wind data at, at one AU uh, shown here, and it is yeah, it is. Somebody said it's way more regular, and well, there is a regularity to it, and your eye can probably pick out a bit of a periodicity too. And I'm curious what. Uh, what you think about that that sort of dominant periodicity of about 0.075 of a year is that something that sounds familiar yep wrote i'm not seeing yeah 112 yeah what one over 13.3 or so but yeah it's about it's about 27 days that is essentially the carrington rotation rate. And what we're seeing is the expansion of the rotating corona. And here's a here's a 3D picture of what the rotating corona sort of looks like um, uh, uh, from, from, from a 3D MHD simulation. The solar wind is rotationally modulated. So a lot of the time variable structure that we see in the so-called ambient solar wind, um, again, forgetting about things like CMEs, um, is is dominated by solar rotation. Yeah, we'll talk a lot more about you know the formation of co-rotating streams and all that 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 are big impactors to uh, space weather as well. Um, yeah, I guess we won't in this semester. We don't have too much time to talk about solar flares and just a little bit of time to talk about CMEs. I wanted to introduce them just as primary drivers of space weather. Right, the flares produce bursts of electromagnetic radiation. That can you know travel to Earth very very quickly and you know dominate big swaths of the electromagnetic spectrum, um, 
And then of course there are the CMEs and of course both flares and CMEs can produce energetic particles that can be accelerated and escape all the way to the, uh, all the, way to the earth. Uh, those particles can be anywhere from relative, you know, super relativistic, you know, getting close to the speed of light to a few times slower. So the, the energetic particles take only minutes to hours to get to the earth. And then of course there are these perturbed magnetic fields that you can see these sort of circular or light bulb shaped uh, uh, CMEs. They flow out with the solar wind at hundreds of kilometers per second. And it takes a few days for those disturbances to reach the earth. And that's essentially the cause of the geomagnetic storms where the earth's magnetic field gets, gets perturbed by interacting with these things. Uh, where the earth is in its orbit. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know if there's a strong seasonality to, uh, to, to what we see. Of course, there, you know, if we're, if there's a spacecraft that's at the orbit of the Earth, I'll bet there's a, there's a one-year period based on the, the, the slight ellipticity to the, to the Earth's orbit. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a huge range of, of travel times for these things too. Yeah, we'll be talking about that a lot. And of course, you know, the whole issue of space weather is, is becoming more important these days because, you know, yes, you know, our, our, our millennia of biological history, we've been very lucky that the Earth's magnetosphere has been here to shield us from a lot of these uh, effects of the, of the sun. Um, but as we're starting to build non-biological things, you know, big tech, you know, you know, big, you know, uh, you know, power lines and pipelines and large conductors over the surface of the Earth, and of course also send things up into space, uh, we're finding that those things can be much more strongly impacted by the uh, by the particles and the radiation and the perturbed magnetic and electric fields coming from our star. Yes. So yeah, uh, we're going to spend you know three or four or five weeks or so on uh, on on specific space weather impacts. Um, yeah, technological systems. Um, things on the ground, things in the sky, aircraft, things in space, uh, human safety, you know, the astronauts getting radiation doses from, from, from solar storms. There's all sorts of these things and it's important to know about them. And yeah, I think that kind of brings me to the end of what I had planned for, for today. Um, I, uh, I've got, I've, I've, I've posted a, a, a set of, you know, uh, tips and hints about, you know, how to best read a scientific paper. Again, I'm not sure what stage of, of, you know, grad school and research that, that everybody involved is, is, is at. So I thought it would be fun to sort of assemble, uh, some, some guidance about, about how to get the most out of, out of reading papers. Um, so please take a look at that. It's, it's on the, uh, it's on the webpage. Um, I should probably put a link on the Slack also. The, uh, the first quote unquote paper that I'd like to read is chapter one of Marcus Ashwanden's uh, textbook on the solar corona, because it's really a nice summary uh, of some of the things that I've gone over today and some of the things I haven't. Um, for CU students, you can actually grab the whole book as a PDF if you like. Um, I don't know about the library access that students at the other universities have. So I put the, the chapter one on, on a Google Drive link. Um, again, I put the Google Drive link in the Slack um, channel of the paper one discussion. Um, I, I, I think it would be interesting to read the entire chapter, but if, if, you, if you are pressed for time, uh, uh, there's a few of those sections that I think are, are safer to skip than, than others. And uh, yeah, after you, after you read it, or even as you read it, feel free to go onto the Slack and put in any questions, thoughts, ideas, you know, anything that pops into your mind really that's relevant to the, uh, relevant to the, uh, to this chapter. And I think we can see how the, uh, how the, uh, how the discussion goes. Um, a few other things in the Slack. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't repeat the questions. So that'll be, so, so they'll be there in the, uh, in the audio. I, th I think um, when we eventually put this on YouTube, I think, the, the chat won't be there. Um, if I can give you access to the, 
to the Zoom cloud recording, the chat is there, but I think that's not going to go out over the over the full internet. Um, yeah, I mean, this kind of the 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 uh, our, our our study of space weather. You know, uh, Gilly Gilly posted a, uh, a a typical question from a member of the public, I guess. Right? Why does astronomy help people anyway? Shouldn't we focus on Earth more? Um, you know, space weather is a very practical. Uh, 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 practical type thing that 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 is very useful to to study, and there are all sorts of follow-ons. Um, I don't think it totally clobbers our our desire to do pure science, um, but uh, but it is a very useful uh, useful piece of the puzzle for us. Yeah, I guess we are supposed to be done at four fifty. We're about two minutes from that, so I, maybe it's a good time to to stop. Yeah, does anybody have any other? Thoughts or, or concerns or any other questions about the course as we go? Yes, I'm definitely okay with auditors. That was another question in the chat. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I guess that that wraps it up for today. Um, yeah, welcome to the class, everybody. Um, I'm hoping that we can have some, oops, I'm hoping that we can have some uh, some interaction between the students at the different universities. Hopefully the Slack will, will allow us to, uh, to all be sort of chatting together about some of these things. And uh, yeah, I, I, I hope everybody sort of gets to know everybody um, through that through that channel. All righty. Well, I will see you next week then. Thanks, Steve. All righty. Thank you. Hey, Thank Steve. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.